What's up, everybody? This is your boy Tech G back with another video to help you successfully pass the CompTIA Network Plus N10 007 certification. So let's get into it. In this video, you're going to learn about networking attacks such as denial of service, social engineering, insider threats, logic bombs, rogue access points, evil twins, war driving, phishing, ransomware, DNS poisoning, art poisoning spoof, deauthentication, brute force attacks, VLAN hopping, man in the middle, and exploits versus vulnerabilities. Let's talk about denial of service. So a denial of service attack occurs when legitimate users are unable to access information systems, devices, or other network resources due to the actions of a malicious cyber threat actor. Services affected may include email, websites, online accounts, or other services that rely on the affected computer or network. A DOS condition is accomplished by flooding the target host or network with traffic until the target cannot respond or simply crashes, preventing access access for legitimate users. DOS attacks can cost an organization both time and money while their resources and services are inaccessible. And we have three types of DOS attacks that you need to be familiar with. The first one is called a reflective denial of service. So a reflective DOS attack, this makes use of a potentially legitimate third party component to send attack traffic to a victim, ultimately hiding the attacker's own identity. The attackers send packets to a reflector server with a source IP set to their victim's IP, therefore indirectly overwhelming the victim with response packets. Reflector servers used for this purpose could be ordinary servers, not obviously compromised, which makes this kind of attack particularly difficult to mitigate. The next one we have is called an amplified denial of service. So an amplified DOS attack uses legitimate DNS servers that are tricked into flooding responses toward a targeted system by sending small queries that result in large responses, which allows for a malicious user to send more smaller requests that result in larger responses that hit the target. And then we have a distributed denial of service. So a DDoS attack, this is a malicious attempt to disrupt the normal traffic of a targeted server, service or network by overwhelming the target or its surrounding infrastructure with a flood of internet traffic. DDoS attacks achieve effectiveness by utilizing multiple compromised computer systems as sources of attack traffic. Exploited machines can include computers and other network resources such as IoT devices. From a high level, a DDoS attack is like an unexpected traffic jam clogging up the highway, preventing regular traffic from arriving at its destination. Next, let's talk about social engineering, and this is the psychological manipulation of people into performing actions or divulging confidential information. This differs from social engineering within social sciences, which does not concern the divulging of confidential information. A type of confidence trick for the purpose of information gathering, fraud, or system access, it differs from a traditional con in that it is often one of many steps in a more complex fraud scheme. And here are some examples of social engineering that you need to be concerned with. The first one is called pretexting, and this is gaining users' trust by claiming to be from the IT department or the internet provider or the phone company, etc., followed by asking the user to enter or provide a password to a system so that the quote-unquote tech can make changes to the system. The next one is called phishing, and this is the fraudulent attempt to obtain sensitive information such as username, passwords, and credit card details often for malicious reasons by disguising oneself as a trustworthy entity in an electronic communication. Next, we have spear phishing, and this is a form of phishing such as a fake email message that appears to come from another department in the company and requests information from a specific targeted individual or department. And then we have compromised passwords, and this is when users who don't change their passwords after an IT technician or outside contractor tests their system, they leave their systems vulnerable. Also understand that training users to understand, detect, and reject social engineering and other types of deceit is essential to protecting important information. 
Let's talk about an insider threat. So an insider threat, this is a malicious threat to an organization that comes from people within the organization, such as employees, former employees, contractors, or business associates who have insider information concerning the organization's security practices, data, and computer systems. The threat may involve fraud, the theft of confidential or commercially valuable information, the theft of intellectual property, or the sabotage of computer systems. And the insider threat comes in three categories. You have malicious insiders, and these are people who take advantage of their access to inflict harm on an organization. Then you have negligent insiders, and these are people who make errors and disregard policies, which place their organization at risk. And then you have infiltrators, and these are external actors that obtain legitimate access credentials without authorization. Next, we have a logic bomb. And a logic bomb, this is a piece of code intentionally inserted into a software system that will set off a malicious function when specified conditions are met. So for example, a programmer may hide a piece of code that starts deleting files, such as a salary database trigger, should they ever be terminated from the company. Software that is inherently malicious, such as viruses and worms, they often contain logic bombs that execute a certain payload at a predefined time or when some other condition is met. This technique can be used by a virus or worm to gain momentum and spread before being noticed. Some viruses attack their host systems on specific dates such as Friday the 13th or April Fool's Day. Trojans and other computer viruses that activate on certain dates are often called time bombs. To be considered a logic bomb, the payload should be unwanted and unknown to the user of the software. Next, we have a rogue access point, and this is a wireless access point that has been installed on a secure network without explicit authorization from a local network administrator, whether added by a well-meaning employee or by a malicious attacker. To prevent the installation of rogue access points, organizations can install wireless intrusion prevention systems to monitor the radio spectrum for unauthorized access points. Next, we have an evil twin. An evil twin, this is a fraudulent Wi-Fi access point that appears to be legitimate, but is set up to eavesdrop on wireless communications. The evil twin is the wireless LAN equivalent of the phishing scam. This type of attack may be used to steal the passwords of unsuspecting users, either by monitoring their connections or by phishing, which involves setting up a fraudulent website and luring people there. The attacker snoops on internet traffic using a bogus wireless access point point, unwitting web users may be invited to log into the attacker server, prompting them to enter sensitive information such as usernames and passwords. Often users are unaware they have been duped until well after the incident has occurred. Next, we have war driving, and this involves attackers searching for wireless networks with vulnerabilities while moving around an area in a moving vehicle. The attackers use hardware and software to discover unsecured Wi-Fi networks and gain unauthorized access to the network network by cracking passwords or decrypting the router. The attacker then records vulnerable network locations on digital maps, known as access point mapping, and may share that information with third-party applications and websites. War driving can have several variations depending on the mode of transport the hacker has used, such as war biking, war cycling, war railing, war jogging, and war walking. Ransomware. This is a type of malware from crypto virology that threatens to publish the victim's personal data or perpetually block access to it unless a ransom is paid. While some simple ransomware may lock the system so that it is not difficult for a knowledgeable person to reverse, more advanced malware uses a technique called cryptoviral extortion. It encrypts the victim's files, making them inaccessible, and demands a ransom payment to decrypt them. In a properly implemented cryptoviral extortion attack, recovering the files without the decryption key is an intractable problem and difficult to trace digital currencies such as Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies that are used for the ransoms. They make tracing and prosecuting the perpetrators extremely difficult. Next, we have DNS poisoning, and this is also known as DNS cash poisoning or DNS spoofing, and this is a highly deceptive cyber attack in which hackers redirect web traffic towards a fake web server and phishing websites. These 
fake sites typically look like the user's intended destination, making it easy for hackers to trick visitors into sharing sensitive information. In a DNS poisoning attack, hackers alter a domain name system to a spoof DNS so that when a legitimate user goes to a website, instead of landing on their intended destination, they actually end up at an entirely different website. Usually this happens without users even knowing as the fake sites are often made to look like the real ones. Then we have art poisoning or address resolution protocol poisoning. So art poisoning, this is a technique by which an attacker sends spoof art messages onto a LAN. Generally, the aim is to associate the attacker's MAC address with the IP address of another host, such as the default gateway, causing any traffic meant for that IP address to be sent to the attacker instead. ARP spoofing may allow an attacker to intercept data frames on the network, modify the traffic, or stop all traffic. Often the attack is used as an opening for other attacks, such as denial of service, man in the middle, or session hijacking attacks. The attack can only be used on networks that use ARP and requires the attacker to have direct access to the local network segment to be attacked. Next, we have spoofing. Spoofing, this is the act of disguising a communication or identity so that it appears to be associated with a trusted authorized source. Spoofing attacks can take many forms from the common email spoofing attacks that are deployed in phishing campaigns, the caller ID spoofing attacks that are often used to commit fraud. Attackers may also target more technical elements of an organization's network, such as an IP address, DNS server, or ARP service as part of a spoofing attack. Spoofing Spoofing attacks typically take advantage of trusted relationships by impersonating a person or organization that the victim knows. In some cases, such as whale phishing attacks that feature email spoofing or website spoofing, these messages may even be personalized to the victim in order to convince that person that the communication is legitimate. If the user is unaware that internet communications can be fake, they are especially likely to fall prey to a spoofing attack. Next, we have deauthentication. So a Wi-Fi deauthentication attack is a type of denial of service attack that targets communication between a user and a Wi-Fi wireless access point. Unlike most radio jammers, deauthentication acts in a unique way. The IEEE 802.11 or the Wi-Fi protocol contains the provision for a deauthentication frame. Sending the frame from the access point to a station is called a sanction technique to inform a rogue station that they have been disconnected connected from the network. An attacker can send a deauthentication frame at any time to a wireless access point with a spoofed address for the victim. The protocol does not require any encryption for the frame, even when the session was established with WEP for data privacy, and the attacker only needs to know the victim's MAC address, which is available in the clear through wireless network sniffing. One of the main purposes of deauthentication used in the hacking community is to force clients to connect to an evil twin access point, which can then be used to capture network packets transferred between the client and the access point. The attacker conducts a deauthentication attack to the target client, disconnecting it from its current network, thus allowing the client to automatically connect to the evil twin access point. Next, we have brute force. So in cryptography, a brute force attack consists of an attacker submitting many passwords or passphrases with the hope of eventually guessing a combination correctly. The attacker systematically checks all possible passwords and pass phrases until the correct one is found. System and network administrators setting up password rules that require a system to lock after a specified number of incorrect passwords or input is one way to prevent a brute force attack. Also longer passwords, they aid in the fight against brute force attacks as well. Next we have VLAN hopping. And this is a computer security exploit, a method of attacking network resources on a VLAN. The basic concept behind all VLAN hopping attacks is for an attacking host on a VLAN to gain access to traffic on other VLANs that would normally not be accessible. And there are two primary methods of VLAN hopping and they are switch spoofing and double tagging. Switch spoofing, this is when the attacker will send packets to try to negotiate a trunk with the switch. Once you have a trunk to your computer, you will have access to all the VLANs. The other method is called double tagging. And this is when the attacker is connected to an interface in access mode with the same VLAN as the native untagged VLAN on the trunk. The attacker sends two tags, the inner VLAN tag for the VLAN that the attacker wants to reach and the outer VLAN tag for the native VLAN. When the switch receives the frame, it will remove the first native VLAN tag and forward the frame with the second tag on its trunk interface. 
face. The attacker will now have jumped from the native VLAN to the victim's VLAN. Then we have man in the middle. In cryptography and computer security, a man in the middle attack is a cyber attack where the attacker secretly relays and possibly alters captured communications between two parties who believe that they are directly communicating with each other. Then we have exploits and an exploit. This is a code that takes advantage of a software vulnerability or security flaw. It is written either by security researchers as a proof of concept threat or by malicious actors for use in their operations. When used, exploits allow an intruder to remotely access a network and gain elevated privileges or move deeper into the network. In some cases, an exploit can be used as part of a multi-component attack. Instead of using a malicious file, the the exploit may instead drop another malware, which can include backdoor trojans and spyware that can steal user information from the infected systems. And then we have a vulnerability, and this is a weakness which can be exploited by a threat actor, such as an attacker to cross privileged boundaries or perform unauthorized actions within a computer system. To exploit a vulnerability, an attacker must have at least one applicable tool or technique that can connect to a system weakness. In this frame, vulnerabilities are also known as the attack surface. All right, and that is my quick little class on network attacks. So let's go ahead and get into some of this outstanding check on learning. So the first question is, what is a type of attack that is used to redirect web traffic towards fake web servers and phishing websites? Would it be art poisoning, DNS poisoning, war driving, or spoofing? So which one of these is going to redirect web traffic to a fake website? And the correct answer is... That will be DNS poisoning or domain name system poisoning. Next question. Which is not a form of social engineering? Is it pretexting, phishing, compromised passwords, or brute force? So which one of these is not a form of social engineering? And the correct answer would be a brute force attack. This is not a form of social engineering. Remember, social engineering is designed to get somebody else to do something for you under the guise of some type of fraud or whatever the case may be. A brute force attack is simply a person entering a password and a passphrase over and over again until they get the right combination to gain unauthorized access. Next question. Which is an attack that uses an illegitimate wireless access point to eavesdrop on wireless communications to steal passwords? Would it be an evil twin, a rogue access point, war driving, or deauthentication? So which one of these uses an illegitimate wireless access point to eavesdrop and steal passwords? And the correct answer is... This would be an evil twin. An evil twin is an access point somebody would set up explicitly for the purposes of trying to capture packets to get access to username and passwords. A rogue access point could be an access point that somebody sets up on the network without getting permission to set the access point up on the network, whether for illegitimate reasons or maybe somebody simply just didn't know what the rules were. All right, so in summary, we have talked about networking attacks such as denial of service, social engineering, insider threats, logic bombs, rogue access points, evil twins, war driving, phishing, ransomware, DNS poisoning, art poisoning, spoofing, deauthentication, brute force attacks, VLAN hopping, man in the middle attacks, exploits, and vulnerabilities. Now, if you felt like you've gotten something valuable out of this information, go ahead and hit the like button, share button, drop a comment, but most importantly, subscribe to this channel. Also go check out my website, Technology G, so that you can get read up on the latest and greatest to help you successfully pass the CompTIA Network Plus N10-007 certification. And until next video, ladies and gentlemen, peace.